from the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Watch. Well, most of D.C. has been shut down today because of a uh, spring snowstorm, but uh, we're still watching Washington. So coming up, Facebook is keeping a poker face as they're coming under government scrutiny for allegedly allowing the personal data of 50 million users to be released. They could be facing millions of dollars in federal fines for a breach of a 2011 consent decree with the Federal Trade Commission. They're also facing calls from several congressional committees for Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook CEO, to personally testify. Congressman Mike Johnson, a member of the House Judiciary Committee, is one calling for Zuckerberg to appear, and uh, he joins us in just a moment. Also, as promised, we're going to answer the question of uh, one of Washington Watch's listeners. Why are federal employees engaged in sensitive areas of information treated differently than elected officials? Frank Gaffney, founder, president, and CEO of the Center for Security Policy here in Washington, D.C., will be here to help us answer that question. And new international research shows a significant connection between religious freedom and political and economic stability. Tom Farr, an expert in the field, will be here to discuss religious freedom, the freedom to practice one's own religion without fear or interference, the fact that it's an essential prerequisite for a democratic society. And also, as we've discussed here several times in the last couple of weeks, CIA Director Mike Pompeo has been tapped by President Trump to serve as the new Secretary of State. How significant of a confirmation battle awaits him? And what change will he bring to the agency? FRC's own Travis Weber, the FRC director of the Center for Religious Freedom, will chime in on that discussion. Also, a new uh, Pew Research poll shows an increasingly divided country between the two major political parties. And uh, it shows who's choosing which side. We'll talk about that later here on Washington Watch. Also, let me remind you, coming up May the 23rd through the 25th, FRC's Watchman on the Wall National Pastors briefing. Uh, That'll be at the Hyatt Regency. That is May 23 through 25. If you would like to be a part of that as a pastor, well, go to TonyPerkins.com, follow the links over. If you're on Twitter, you can keep up with me, at T Perkins. All right, we're learning that uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg saved tens of millions of dollars by selling his Facebook stock before the company's decline Uh, This week, Facebook's stock declined by almost 7% on Monday following allegations the company mishandled user data from the platform. This week, lawmakers pushed to question the social media multi-billionaire directly about reports that Cambridge Analytica, a political research company, had obtained private data from users in violation of a 2011 consent decree with the Federal Trade Commission. With us now is Congressman Mike Johnson. He represents the 4th Congressional District of Louisiana. He serves on the House Judiciary Committee. He is one of those calling for Zuckerberg to testify before Congress. Mike, welcome back to Washington Watch. Hey, Tony. Great to be with you, as always. Uh, Mike, how how serious of an issue is this when you, you consider the scope of the reach of Facebook and the fact that it's become kind of a virtual public square that basically shakes you down for information when you enter into that uh, public square. It's it's a very, very important issue of grave concern to many of us in the Congress who are privacy advocates. You know, this is a a major issue. uh, Some people will remember back in 2011, the Federal Trade Commission entered into a consent decree with Facebook. This was a concern and has been for years. And the the, the terms of the consent decree said it required Facebook to obtain consent from their users before any of their data was shared. And this appears to be just an open breach of that requirement of Facebook. And that that was a necessary safeguard and protection for for people, consumers, average everyday Americans who have no idea that their data is being mined, that their personal information is being being, uh, co-opted and shared for ulterior motives of outside organizations. It's a very, very serious concern for all of us. I mean, as conservatives, I mean, we are, um, we do not particularly care for government regulation. We like free trade. We like free interaction. We like low government regulation and taxes. But you have Facebook and and other social media platforms, Twitter and others that are, are literally holding themselves out as a virtual public square. 
And we're, we're seeing increasingly where, number one, there's concern, security concerns over the information that they're releasing that they're not supposed to. I know the attorney general in uh, Missouri has been on this issue, uh, actually taking legal action against um, some of these mega giants in the tech industry. Um, so we have a couple of questions here. One is, what are they doing with that data? How are they getting it? How are they using it? How are they profiting from it? And then, and then secondly, uh, is it truly a public square where all viewpoints are welcomed? And may we be reaching a point like we did back with a monopoly uh, years ago with a phone company where it's, uh, it's time to uh, allow a little competition? These are very, very important questions. Look, the, the you and I have been advocates of, of the free marketplace of ideas our whole lives. As conservatives, we believe in that. We're not for censorship. We're not for silencing other viewpoints. We're for open discussion out there in, in the open marketplace, as you say. But the, the public forum, to have a, a truly open public square, the requirement is that it, that it be open, that it not be manipulated. And, and now you have you know, Facebook, uh, by all appearances, manipulating the, the public square. It, it really isn't public if some people are at the control panel behind the curtain. And that's what it looks like. It, you know, it, it leads to all sorts of, um, of nefarious uses of people's personal data. And, and that's why there's uh, at least one commissioner of the FTC uh, this week has said what, what many of us believe, consumers really do need some stronger protections in the digital age. We're in uncharted waters in so many ways with the way technologies develop. And, and some of these things might include, you know, comprehensive data security and, and, and maybe um, enhanced privacy laws. We need transparency and accountability for people who deal, you know, in, in data, the data brokers, as it were. They need to let people know what they're doing, how this is being used. And, and again, we ought to require consent. If, you know, someone's going to give up their privacy and all their personal information. I mean, we have our children on Facebook. You know, some of our us have, have uh, teenagers and young right. adults who – uh, or unwittingly going onto these social media sites and sharing all sorts of things about themselves. We've got tight controls at our house, but not everybody does. And 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 this is uh, you know the question is where does all this end? So these are these are important questions right now. They're not just rhetorical. They're very real questions, and I think we've got to get some answers to. Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, Josh Hawley, the uh, Attorney General for Missouri, who actually happens to be a Senate candidate. Uh, we had him on the program, uh, I think, last week, week before, discussing this. He's been pursuing this, trying to discover, um, you know, how this information is being used, um, basically profiting on this private information that people do not know that's being used in that way. And so there's information being gathered about, uh, you know, what sites you go to, uh, other personal data, and then it's being sold uh, and used in ways that uh, are you know, they, they, as you said, they don't have consent to do that. So, uh, Congressman Johnson, what, what are the prospects, you think, of uh, seeing Zuckerberg testify before Congress on this matter? Well, look, I'm, I'm one of the members uh, calling for that. As a member of the House Judiciary Committee, we certainly have uh, jurisdiction over these types of issues. And I think it's an important concern. And, and by the way, this is a concern that is uh, goes across the aisle. This is a bipartisan uh, leaders on both sides calling for uh, some real accountability here. And I think, you know, Zuckerberg is the CEO, the head of Facebook. Uh, he's ultimately the one responsible. Now, now they've it's been suggested over the last 24 hours that there might be member briefings with members of the uh, Judiciary Committees on the Senate and House side and maybe the Intelligence Committees, uh, but that, you know, uh, some, some Facebook personnel may come over and answer some questions. But, but of, of something that is of this degree of concern and, and seriousness to virtually all, all the people in this country, you know, I think it's appropriate for the CEO to come in and answer those questions himself. And so hopefully we'll, we'll get to that in the next uh, several weeks. You're listening to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. Glad to have you with us on this uh, Wednesday afternoon. Mike Johnson, my guest, a member of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, represents the 3rd Congressional District. Uh, actually, is it the third or fourth? Fourth. Fourth. Yeah, that's right. I should know that. <laughs> I should know that. Third is down south. Fourth is up in Yankee Land, up there in uh, North yeah. Louisiana. Um, so, 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 Mike, the the uh, the news now that uh, Zuckerberg sold off stock just as it b- before it plummeted because of this uh, scrutiny raise any questions? 
Uh, it does, as does the relationship that Facebook had with Cambridge Analytica. You know, that's the the, the, the company that stabbed all the headlines this week. And, you know, Facebook's initial response was curious. They said they, they did they admit, of course, to releasing some data, they said to a researcher uh, at, at Cambridge Analytica, but, but they claimed that whatever Cambridge did with it from that point had to have been a breach of the, of the terms and it shouldn't have happened. You know, we're really, really concerned about about that company and, and the allegations and, and even the, the hidden video now that's being released um, you know, on the news in, in bits and pieces. I mean, apparently that, that company was involved in some pretty nefarious activities. I mean, uh, to the extent they wanted to, they were offering to bribe or suggest anyway that political officials or candidates should be bribed and and uh, put into all sorts of uh, compromising moral situations. I mean, there, there's just a lot of, of very uh, deep concerning questions about this. And, and again, I think that's why uh, Zuckerberg himself would be the appropriate person to ask these questions of, because at the end of the day, the buck stops at his desk at Facebook, and, and it's a big buck because it is a giant company, and they have so much influence and control over social media and, and by extension, really every aspect of our lives these days. I mean, it's just a behemoth. Th these are things we've got to get down to the bottom of. Yeah, I think it's it's critical given – uh, really a monopoly that they have on uh, what we would call the virtual public square. If you're listening to Washington Watch, I'm your host, Tony Perkins. Again, Mike Johnson, congressman from Louisiana, the 4th Congressional District. My guest, uh, I've been talking about uh, Facebook. But let me uh, transition, Mike. we just got a couple minutes left. Um, obviously, a lot of folks watching the omnibus spending bill, $1.2 trillion dollars. Uh, supposed to have been out earlier this week. Um, are we going to uh, to make the deadline of uh, passing something by uh, Friday night, or are we going to see a, a short-term CR? Well, as you and I speak uh, early afternoon uh, today, we're not yet sure. We haven't gotten the text of the book that is supposed to be released here shortly. Uh, but we're, we're told that there will be a vote uh, on the House floor tomorrow. So, uh, we, we shall see. We're, we're kind of in the dark on it as well as, as rank and file members of Congress. And, you know, that's part of the problem. We we really had an opportunity to openly debate and have much debate on, on the, the terms and provisions of this. We hadn't had a chance to have amendments as would go over the process. And and that's a concern to us. The increase in spending is, is a big problem. And, um, we, we've just got some concerns as conservatives. Yeah, uh, we were talking with Andy Biggs, uh, one of your fellow Freedom Caucus members yesterday, mm -hmm. about it. That, you know, if the, the ball was moving a little bit more toward the conservative goal, conservatives could go along with it. But we're not seeing that progress. No, and, you know, the, the carrot here is the increase in, in defense spending, which we all know is absolutely critical. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm a defense hawk, but I'm also a, a fiscal hawk as well. Those should not be mutually exclusive pursuits. We shouldn't be in the, the position to have to, to, to choose one or another. We should be able to do both. The problem is that Schumer and the Democrats in the Senate hold all of this hostage, and they, right. they won't in, you know, they won't agree to military spending unless we get an increase in discretionary domestic spending. That's the problem. Yeah, they're driving the train, unfortunately, they shouldn't be. Uh, Mike uh, Johnson, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll be watching closely. Keep up the great work, my friend. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Mike Johnson from Louisiana. Coming up next, Frank Gaffney here to help us answer a question from a Washington Watch listener. Don't go away. We're back with more right after this. Most people remember Frederick Douglass as a fiery speaker who denounced slavery and advocated for the civil rights of African Americans and women. What is less known is Douglass's commitment to faith and family. The month of February marked the bicentennial of Frederick Douglass's birth, so it is a fitting time to reflect on the legacy of this great author, scholar, humanitarian, and entrepreneur who served five United States presidents. In an exclusive Family Research Council speaker series event, Reverend Dean Nelson, chairman of the board for the Frederick Douglass Foundation, and Colin Hanna, president of Let Freedom Ring, explore the life of Douglass as a Christian minister, a husband, and a father, and examine how his legacy can be an example for Christian citizenship today. 
To view this important event, go to frc.org slash Douglas. Again, that is frc.org slash Douglas. Somewhere out there right now, a teacher is using a new technique. Not to teach some new math method, but to control the emotions of children in the classroom. Sounds like a conspiracy theory, doesn't it? It's not. Social emotional learning, known as SEL, is a new catchphrase that now dominates public education policy. However, hidden behind the SEL claim of building kids' self-confidence is a statist agenda of social engineering that insists on total conformity of thought. It disregards the genuine individuality of students and their family relationships and requires monitoring and tracking of their emotions. Don't miss FRC's new speaker series event featuring Stella Morabito, in which she discusses how SEL is programming our children by enforcing conformity, invading privacy, and undermining the influence of family and faith in a child's life. Learn more at FRC.org slash SEL. Again, that's FRC.org slash SEL. If you're like me, you care a lot about where our country is headed. With so much at stake in America, do our leaders have a way forward? To find out, mark your calendars for the Values Voters Summit on September 21st to 23rd in Washington, D.C., and join hundreds of Americans who, like you, want a culture in which human life is valued, families flourish, and religious liberty thrives. Past speakers at this conference include Donald Trump, Mike Pence, Mike Huckabee, Paul Ryan, Ben Carson, Steve Scalise, Kellyanne Conway, Kirk Cameron, Laura Ingram, Dana Lash, Sean Hannity, and Mark Levine. On September 21st to 23rd, stand with Values Voters to restore our great nation. Registration is now open. Don't miss the special early bird price, but act fast. Visit ValuesVotersSummit.org for more information. That's ValuesVotersSummit.org. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. Glad to have you with us on this uh, Wednesday afternoon. Snowy Wednesday in Washington, D.C., but fortunately I escaped. Uh, All right. You know, as we like to do, we want to answer the questions of our listeners. And one of the issues that came up, it's been kind of percolating out there for some time, going back to Hillary Clinton and uh, the the, um, breach of security with the the, uh, sensitive documents that she had. There appears to be a difference between the way civilian employees of the federal government, those who handle sensitive information, are treated and those in elected office. And so what's the difference? Why are they treated differently? Well, joining us now uh, to give us some insight into this is Frank Gaffney, founder and president and CEO of the Center for Security Policy. Frank, welcome back to Washington Watch. It's great to be with you, Tony. Thanks for having me. Well, Frank, um, I I know this is something you – obviously uh, know something about, having been in the uh, Department of Defense and having worked in the federal government. But when you look at uh, the issue of uh, it, it's come up recently or it's been in the news for the last few years, Hillary Clinton, uh, the way she mishandled uh, uh, secure documents, secret documents, and the fact that uh, if you're a, an employee, a federal employee that has access to these documents, you – you have to undergo polygraphs. Your financial information is looked at on a routine basis to make sure you're not on the take with a federal with a with a foreign government. Why is there a difference in the way that elected officials are treated and non-elected officials that have security clearances? Well, there are a couple of things to unpack here, uh, Tony. And just as you know, uh, having also spend time in government, uh, there are different levels of classification. Uh, not everybody needs to be polygraphed uh, just because they have access to uh, some level of classified information, um, but some do. But all of them are supposed to be screened for you know, the possibility that um, they may be a security risk. So there is a background investigation that is done on them, and they have to be vetted in a manner of speaking. Uh, One of the problems that has arisen, and it was particularly um, egregious during the Clinton administration, not not Hillary's uh, time at the State Department, but her husband's time as president, was uh, there was this enormous backlog 
of cases that needed those kinds of background investigations. And what the Clinton administration did was contract out some of the screening, the vetting, if you will, and it turned out that one of the groups that they used, uh, an outfit known as, uh, I believe it's the U.S. Investigative Service, uh, uh, USIS, uh, wound up doing what they call flushing of these background investigations, and some 600,000 people got clearances who had not actually been vetted at all. So it's a little uneven, but in principle, the point is, if you are a federal government employee, you are supposed to go through a security process to be evaluated as to whether you can handle this information properly. And, and of course, there are people like Hillary Clinton who didn't, obviously. But this is in stark contrast to what has happened in the legislative branch. Mm -hmm. um, our friend Trevor Loudon, who I know you've talked with over the years, as have I, is a wonderful turn of phrase. He's, uh, of course, a, a, a Kiwi uh, from New Zealand. He has been looking, though, very carefully for a long time at the kind of people who we have elected uh, in primarily the Democratic Party with very dubious backgrounds, uh, some of them social democrats, some of them um, outright communists, actually, some of them, um, you know, Muslim Brotherhood uh, affiliated individuals. But here's the point. He says that none of these people could pass a background investigation we would require of folks who drive school buses or sell you stamps in the post office. And this is the point I suspect your caller is asking about is what is up with that? Yeah. Just because you get elected, you are automatically considered to be uh, not a security risk. Ain't necessarily so, Tony. So how, how do we address that? How is that, uh, how is that remedied? Well, at the moment, uh, you'd have to get members of Congress, I suspect, to adopt uh, new statutes that would govern them. And uh, they have, a, as you know, a, a certain proclivity not to do that. Uh, they right. exempt themselves from the rules that everybody else uh, has applied to them. I do think one thing that could be maybe a fairly straightforward reform, though, is how – the people who are given access to extremely sensitive, I mean, the most sensitive information of all, who serve on the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, Tony, they should, it seems to me, have to have some sort of special um, vetting take place. And that's particularly important because, as we've seen recently, of course, in connection with this business with the House um, Intelligence Committee's Democrats, uh, led by Congressman Adam Schiff, these are people who are appointed by Nancy Pelosi, and she's the only one who makes that call on the Democratic side, for their partisan you know, um, expertise, not because they actually have you know, security backgrounds or any demonstrated ability to handle classified information well. And a personal um, you know, pet peeve of mine is Andre Carson. A man who has been very closely associated with Sharia supremacists like the Muslim Brotherhood for years. And I think a lot of his colleagues have very real concerns about his reliability on the House Intelligence Committee. It seems to me those sorts of people ought to be excluded by having just a basic background investigation required in order for them to have access to all of the most secret information in the land. Uh, troubling when you uh, you look at the, the the possibilities that can come from not securing that information. But I, I think it, it comes back, Frank, number one, to the voter, that this needs to be a factor that that is considered when we elect someone, that they are trustworthy, Absolutely. that they love America, and that they will not undermine America. Frank, we're out yeah. of time. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, as always, great to uh, talk to you. Appreciate your expertise. Thank you, Tony. Always great to talk with you. That's Frank Gaffney, founder, president, and CEO of the Center for Security Policy. To find out more, go to the website, TonyPerkins.com. Uh, as I mentioned, folks, this is one of those things you've got to consider when uh, you vote for someone. All right. All right. Coming up next, is there a connection between religious freedom and political and economic stability? Tom Farr joins us next here on Washington Watch. Don't go away.
Hello, this is Tony Perkins with the Family Research Council here in Washington, and we're defending and advancing the things that matter most, faith, family, and freedom. Please stand with us right now. Our work depends on people like you who truly care about the future of our nation. You can make your gifts by going to TonyPerkins.com or by calling toll-free 800-225-4008. Again, our number, 800-225-4008 or at TonyPerkins.com. Most people remember Frederick Douglass as a fiery speaker who denounced slavery and advocated for the civil rights of African Americans and women. What is less known is Douglass's commitment to faith and family. In an exclusive FRC Speaker Series event, Reverend Dean Nelson and Colin Hanna explore the life of Douglass as a Christian minister, husband, and father, and examine how his legacy can be an example for Christian citizenship today. To view this important event, go to frc.org Douglass. Who is speaking up for Christians in Washington, D.C.? For over 35 years, Family Research Council has been your voice for advancing faith, family, and freedom in public policy and culture from a Christian worldview in our nation's capital. Stand with us as we defend the truth and preserve the vision that our founding fathers had for this country. To learn more about FRC, go to frc.org and follow us on social media to stay up to date on the latest news. Hello, this is Tony Perkins with the Family Research Council here in Washington, and we're defending and advancing the things that matter most, faith, family, and freedom. Please stand with us right now. Our work depends on people like you who truly care about the future of our nation. You can make your gift by going to TonyPerkins.com or by calling toll-free 800-225-4008. Again, our number, 800-225-4008 or at TonyPerkins.com. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. So glad uh, that you have joined us on this Wednesday afternoon. The website, TonyPerkins.com. All right. um, New evidence, new research shows the connection between religious freedom and political and economic stability. Now, we've seen in the last uh, decade religious freedom uh, is in global decline. Uh, And even here in the West, we're seeing it. Violent religious persecution is on the rise. Anti-Semitism and persecution toward Christians and other religious minorities are rampant. Joining us now is Tom Farr. He served in the U.S. Army and Foreign Service for 28 years. He has spent the last two decades advocating for religious freedom, including as founding director of the State Department's Office of International Religious Freedom and as director of Georgetown's Religious Freedom Research Project. Tom is currently associate professor of the practice of religion and international affairs at uh, Georgetown and uh, is also president of the Religious Freedom Institute, a new nonprofit that defends the right of everyone to religious freedom. Tom, welcome back to Washington Watch. Thank you, Tony. It's good to be with you. Uh, I, I mean, we, we, we kind of know this, but it's always good to see it in the academic world from the standpoint of the research showing that there is a connection between religious freedom and stability in a, in a country which is beneficial to America's foreign policy and our national security. Sure, and it's, uh, I'm glad you put it that way. It's, it's almost common sense. It's certainly intuitive to a lot of us. And the, America's founders understood this. You need religious freedom to have social harmony, political stability, even economic growth. William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, said, come to Pennsylvania. This is in colonial times. We've got religious freedom here. It's good for business, good for trade. He was right, and people came to Pennsylvania. Well, that's all we're showing with the the data. The data prove that, you know, uh, religious freedom can, uh, it, it isn't easy to implement. But once you do it, it has all kinds of benefits for society. And, of course, we we understand that it is it is both morally and on a humanitarian level uh, absolutely necessary for every human being and Christians believe people created in the image and likeness of God want to come you know God wants them to come to Him freely not through coercion that's not the way Jesus worked but it isn't it interesting that the the scholarship now proves what common sense suggests, and we're very happy it's out there. Well, and, you know, this, we've always advocated here at the Family Research Council that social science is well done, prove truth. 
Uh, yes. and, and, and that's what we're seeing here. Of course, America really is an example of that. I mean, of all of the countries, America founded on Christian principles is the most tolerant and the most open, uh, open arms toward religious freedom, where people, I mean, if you're a Christian, you can't openly practice your faith in Saudi Arabia like you if you're a Muslim here in the United States. And so, but look at how society prospers and the security that we have here, relatively speaking, to these to these other countries. Tom, I, I know you see this because you've been working extensively in the Middle East. I was at the end of last year in Egypt, met with um, the, uh, the president, uh, President el-Sisi, and Muslim country, but they are wanting and pursuing religious freedom for all. Now, it's not quite the same as we see it here in the United States, but they're moving in that direction because they realize the connection with the stability that they need. This is a unique time for America to provide really the, uh, I would say, the, 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 the support, the encouragement, and, and even the cover to some degree for those leaders willing to pursue that path. I think that's exactly right, Tony. And, and uh, Ambassador Sam Brownback, who's our near, new uh, ambassador at large for international religious freedom, agrees with this. And uh, I, I want to support him, and I hope all of your listeners will support him in this. The idea here is that uh, religious freedom in countries that are just having all kinds of problems, some of them are, have to do with religious persecution and religious extremism in their societies, but as I said before, it's also economic. The, these, these Arab countries and others in the Middle East are, are having terrible problems. Uh, and it's just it's common sense why this is true. So religious freedom, it's not a silver bullet, but it can help them. And the fact that people like El Sisi and others are understanding this really creates an, open for, an opening for American foreign policy that uh, we have not, quite frankly, uh, stepped into and we certainly didn't under the previous administration. We now have an opportunity. I think we have the right man in place. Uh, and I think the new Secretary of State, once he's confirmed, will be supportive of this. This is important for our country. It's important for Christians and other minorities, as you say, who are being harmed. But it's also a national security interest of the United States. Think right. of religious freedom almost as a counterterrorism, a diplomatic counterterrorism weapon. If we could be successful in getting people in the Middle East to accept this and begin to implement it, move in its direction, we are undermining the possibility of the future ISIS, the future Al-Qaeda's, the spread of these virulent things that require the blood and treasure, have required the blood and treasure of our young men and women. So this is more than humanitarian. It really is a national security issue for the United States. I want to unpack that for just a moment. We're up against a break, so can you hold on for just a moment? And we're going to sure. I'm, I'm unpack that on the other side of the break. Folks, don't go away. Uh, Tom Farr, my guest, talking about the connection between religious freedom and national stability. And from a standpoint of the United States, how this protects us from a standpoint of our national security by promoting religious freedom abroad. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to hear from Travis Weber, the director of our Center for Religious Freedom here at the Family Research Council. So don't, so don't go away. We're coming right back after this message. association game. Are you ready? When I say Washington, D.C., what's the first thing you think of? If you're like many Americans, a word like corruption might top the list, but Christian might be the last thing you'd associate with Washington, D.C. Well, the truth is that Christians have voice in our nation's capital. For over 35 years, Family Research Council has been working daily to advance faith, family, and freedom in public policy and culture from a Christian worldview. When the Christian worldview is being pushed out of the public, FRC is there to stand firm on a biblical vision for America. Will you stand with us? To learn more about Family Research Council and to find out how you can stand with us in defense of faith, family, and freedom, please visit frc.org and follow us on social media to stay up to date on the latest news and ways you can take action. Again, that's frc.org. 
Hello, this is Tony Perkins from Washington Watch. You know, in all my years here at the Family Research Council, one of the things that encourages me the most about you, our listeners, is your willingness to help advance the things that matter most, faith, family, and freedom. Your support is enabling FRC to play a major role in the current administration's actions to protect religious freedom, as well as rolling back threats to pastors' free speech rights, just to name a few. But your help is needed for the work ahead as we seek to protect religious freedom in the military and finally defund Planned Parenthood. Please stand with FRC right at this moment. You can make your gift by going to TonyPerkins.com or make a gift by calling 1-800-225-4008. Again, our number 800-225-4008 or go to TonyPerkins.com. God bless you and may God bless the United States of America. Most people remember Frederick Douglass as a fiery speaker who denounced slavery and advocated for the civil rights of African Americans and women. What is less known is Douglass's commitment to faith and family. The month of February marked the bicentennial of Frederick Douglass's birth, so it is a fitting time to reflect on the legacy of this great author, scholar, humanitarian, and entrepreneur who served five United States presidents. In an exclusive Family Research Council speaker series event, Reverend Dean Nelson, chairman of the board for the Frederick Douglass Foundation, and Colin Hanna, president of Let Freedom Ring, explore the life of Douglass as a Christian minister, a husband, and a father, and examine how his legacy can be an example for Christian citizenship today. To view this important event, go to frc.org slash Douglas. Again, that is frc.org slash Douglas. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm Tony Perkins, your host website, TonyPerkins.com. If you uh, miss anything on your way home this afternoon, stop to get uh, bread or milk. Hey, don't worry. You'll find it all tonight at TonyPerkins.com. All right. Uh, Talking with Tom Farr about the connection between religious freedom and national, international stability and national security for us. Uh, Tom, a great point you're making uh, on the way out of the last segment. I I just want to unpack that for just a moment. Because Religious freedom as a priority in our foreign policy has not only taken a back seat, I think it's been kicked out of the vehicle in the last administration. I I, I think people need to understand the point that you were making. If we promote that, and not promoting a religion, but promoting religious freedom, as according to the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights, meaning the ability to, to... Practice religion, not practice it. Change religion, not change it. It's it's your choice. But if that principle is promoted, we, from a as a national standpoint, in, in, in a selfish, if you will, um, we're less likely to see conflict that would require military resolution. So either we can promote a uh, uh, you know uh, a, a military approach to this, or you know we can promote a human right standpoint of religious freedom, balancing out both less likely we would have to use the military because we would have less likely of these military conflicts. Absolutely right. And again, this is uh, uh, social science research revealing the truth, as you said, revealing what common sense suggests. Uh, I think our founders understood this. Of course, they didn't, they didn't know anything about modern terrorism, but they did know about re- violent religious persecution. We had we had, uh, you know, Baptists were persecuted by Anglicans uh, in the colonies. Uh, Quakers were ha- tortured and hanged on Boston Commons in the 17th, so, 17th century. So they understood that people who feel strongly about religion, uh, if they don't have uh, a sense of equality among all religious groups and, and individuals, could turn to violence, and it's even happened in Christianity. Well, if you could have religious freedom in Muslim-majority societies, what you're doing is providing an opportunity for would-be terrorists and other violent actors to to participate in those societies and to see others as their equals. This is the, the real key here. And, I mean, it, it works. It works in our society. Uh, you know, we, we have to worry about the decline of religious freedom in the United States, but by and large, we have for over 
200 years not been violent toward each other for religious reasons. If right, we could right. export this to these countries, this would save money for us, but more importantly would prevent us from having to uh, send military force into countries that are either unstable because of a religious civil war, but again, even more importantly, uh, religious civil wars can be cordoned off. What cannot be cordoned off are al-Qaeda and right. and these people who would, would really like to, to destroy our country. So it's a counterterrorism tool. I think that's terribly important. I think Sam Brownback understands this. And so the, the point is this administration, at least the steps they've taken thus far with the appointment of Sam Brownback, and I think, as you mentioned, the um, nomination of Mike Pompeo, who, who gets this as well, that as we see the elevation of religious freedom as a foreign policy priority, uh, we will uh, see potentially less conflicts, military conflicts, that the United States has to be engaged in. I think that's exactly right. It's hard work. It's not easy. It's not a silver, bu- silver bullet. But the stakes are so high for our country that, it, to me, it's foolish for us not to make the effort. We're talking about improving our diplomacy. We're not talking about sending divisions or... Uh, bombs or or anything else. We're talking about something that is eminently doable, if difficult. We just need the political will to do it. All right, Tom Farr, as always, great to talk with you. Appreciate all that you do on behalf of religious freedom around the world. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate being with you. All right, Tom Farr, to find out more, go to the website, TonyPerkins.com, and uh, follow the links over uh, in fact, he, he's got some resources. Uh, he, he wrote a book, World of Faith and Freedom, Why International Religious Freedom is Vital to American National Security. Uh, wrote that a number of years ago, so he understands this, has been tracking it. So I'd encourage you to uh, check out the resources. Follow the link over to uh, to Tom Farr. And, and again, encouraged by the fact that this administration is pursuing this approach, no longer hostile to religious freedom, but actually opening their arms and understanding the importance of it. And uh, joining us now uh, is Travis Weber, the director of the Center for Religious Freedom here at the Family Research Council. Travis, welcome back to Washington Watch. Thanks for having me, Tony. All right, just uh, finished our conversation with uh, with Tom Farr about this connection between uh, international religious freedom and uh, stability in these foreign countries, which is a national security uh, plus benefit for uh, the United States. Um, Sam Brownback, as we were talking about, gets this new ambassador for religious freedom at the uh, State Department. Um, and the selection of Mike Pompeo, current CIA director, being tapped by uh, President Trump to lead the Department of State, uh, he, he understands the importance of religious freedom. And uh, we're, we're on the really at the threshold of seeing a rebirth, if you will, of a focus from our State Department, from our federal government, on religious freedom as a foreign policy priority. Yeah, absolutely. There are many who are hopeful that this uh, could be the rebirth, that uh, if Mike Pompeo becomes Secretary of State, um, this could really be a turning point on the issue. You know, we've had requirements in law that it be elevated in foreign policy, but really the the, the ship, you know, uh, the bureaucrats, at the heart of our foreign policy and really, you know, uh, having a lot of say in that area, um, need to, that ship needs to turn. And someone in the Secretary of State role who really understands it, who has the right mindset on the issue, can really help us turn the corner. And I think a lot of people realize this, and this is why many people are so hopeful about it. And, and uh, Tom and I uh, touched on this briefly, but when we talk about religious freedom as a foreign policy priority, and, and I know that uh, I, I think I've, I've read some criticism of Mike Pompeo. There was criticism made of uh, Sam, Ambassador Sam Brownback that because – now, now Sam is, is Catholic, uh, formerly an evangelical, um, but that, that somehow evangelicalism is anti-Muslim when it comes to religious freedom. I mean, but when you look at true biblically – um, based evangelicalism, it is more tolerant than any other religion on the globe in terms of allowing people to choose their religion. Obviously, Christians, from a personal perspective, want people to come to Christ, and, and we, we that's why we're called evangelists, evangel- evangelicals, because we evangelize. Um, but But the fact is that as a foreign policy, I mean, this is more open to... Um, 
Muslim minority groups, uh, other religious minorities being able to practice their faith and having the freedom to do so. Yeah, I mean, so the people who want to criticize Ambassador Brownback in that regard should actually look at what's been done, look at what he's done. He protected uh, mainly Muslims in Darfur decades ago when he was involved in that crisis as a senator. He's made it one of his priorities to now bring attention to the persecution of the Rohingya Muslims in Burma. And you don't have many people doing this. Not many people are going around really focused on protecting these people who are being wiped out in Burma right now, and they're mainly Muslim. So if people actually look at what's going on, the evidence just proves that assertion to be flat wrong. Now, they want to use it to move uh, uh, Christians who have a view of their faith in forming their roles. They want to move those Christians out of public roles. But it, it's not true that, uh, that one believes one's spiritual truths automatically transfer into the public role. Of course that's not true. And the Christians of all, of all faiths should have a basis for believing that religion cannot be coerced and people mm-hmm. should be protected by civil government to believe what they want in civil society. So how challenging of a confirmation is Mike Pompeo going to have as Secretary of State? Well, you know, we'll have to wait and see, but I suspect that uh, the people who do not want a believer um, with a robust understanding of their faith will use what they can use, regardless of the truth. They're going to use what they can to attack him and to work against him. Um, you, know, they, they, you know, we don't know exactly the line of attack they'll take, but we can expect that. I think – you know, what's important here is for many people to realize, and even non-Christians to realize, that uh, Mike Pompeo is going to take an understanding of religion into foreign affairs that uh, we need. We need to turn the corner, and we need in our foreign policy professional, the professionals who work in that field to really understand and view religion as relevant. For so long, many of them right. dismiss it out of hostility or just ignorance. They don't view it as relevant, and this has caused us horrible Uh, problems around the world because we're not dealing with them properly. See, I think I've long contended that uh, evangelicals, those who believe the Bible and and, and seek to live according to the principles of Scripture, have a better understanding of what's happening in the Middle East than those who are dismissive of religion here in this country. Uh, Totally true. And, you know, yeah, let's look at the, you know, if we look at the Middle East for a second, we've heard people, you know, say, well, we just fix the economic situation in a place where radical Islam has appeal. Well, then it'll just go away. Well, it's true that the economic situation is used by radical Muslim preachers, but the point is they're using a religious Islamic basis for their appeal. So it's not irrelevant, and if we don't deal with that, and this is something that Ambassador Brownback is making a point to deal with within uh, Islamic communities with good partners, moderate Muslims who really believe in a proper understanding of civil government and freedom of religion, working with them. If this isn't attacked, we will continue to have problems for years to come. It's good to see Ambassador Brownback dealing with this, and I think Mike Pompeo will take the right approach on these security concerns for everyone, not just the United States, around the world. All right, Travis Weber, as always, uh, great to talk with you. Thanks for joining us today on Washington Watch. Thanks, Tony. All right, folks, to find out more about the uh, Center for Religious Freedom here at the Family Research Council and the great work that uh, Travis is doing, go to the website, TonyPerkins.com, follow the links over. All right, we're going to be tracking this in the, uh, the days ahead as the confirmation uh, begins, the hearings begin to take place for Mike Pompeo, because this is one of the things I said, you can't be a spectator, you have a chance to be a participant, and so we're going to encourage you to reach out to your senators and encourage them to support Mike Pompeo, who has a a great track record, and I think will be a great Secretary of State, the change agent, as I've said and been quoted as saying, that we need at the State Department. All right, folks, you're listening to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. Uh, A few minutes left. I want to wrap up with something. Uh, Pew Research Center came out with uh, another poll or research um, survey, I should say, Uh, between the growing gap between the two political parties. I mean, we have two basic parties in this country, Republican, Democrat. And, you know, as we've long said, they're becoming more polarized. And and what's interesting, there's a couple of things that are are major major factors that I want you to to, uh, pay close attention to, especially parents. All right, there's increasingly the divide in religion is uh, is a major factor. Um, White evangelical Protestants remain one of the most reliable Republican groups of voters. And the GOP's advantage among this segment, this is quoting from the the poll uh, survey, 
uh, of the population has continued to grow in recent years. Seventy-seven percent of white evangelical voters lean toward or identify with the Republican Party, while just eighteen percent have a Democratic orientation. Where the Republican or the Democratic Party is seeing a steady increase is in the religious, religiously unaffiliated voter, who align with the Democratic Party. Um, in 1994, about half, 52 percent of religious unaffiliated voters lean or identify a Democratic Party. Today, it's nearly 68 percent, so almost a, a complete change. Now, of course, the evangelical population is larger than the, the uh, no faith at all people, but it's growing. That's a growing segment. Um, in fact, getting very close to being the same. Some would say, well, that's, you know, that's why the GOP doesn't have a future. Well, again, you don't understand. They don't understand. Evangelical takes its name from the fact that we're evangelistic. We share our faith. We see our faith as growing. And as we share our faith, that grows. As we share our faith, the hearts and minds of people are transformed. And guess what? They begin to live differently. And that includes voting. And that doesn't mean the, the Republican Party is perfect, but it brings them more in line with biblical principles and truth. A couple of other interesting things from this research. Women, especially college graduates, have moved toward the Democratic Party. 37% of registered voters identify as independents, 33% as Democrats, 26% as Republicans. Most independents lean toward one of the major parties, so there's really no big middle ground. Um, but one of the other areas that's very significant is parents you need to pay attention to. Increasingly, college graduates are voting Democrat. Uh, almost exclusively, when you look at... Uh, Voters who have completed college make up a third of all registered voters, and a majority of all of them, at least uh, with a four-year degree, 58% now identify as Democrats. Why is that? What's being taught on college campuses? Folks, if, if, if we want to secure the future of the country, let's start at home by, number one, teaching our children the truths of Scripture. Not just Bible stories, but the truths of Scripture and living it out and modeling it for them. And then... Let's send them to, we want them to be educated, but send them to Christian universities and colleges that have a biblical foundation. Makes a huge difference. I mean, there's a lot of them out there. We have many of them on this program. That, the left does not want you to know. You can have a tremendous shaping influence on the future of America by shaping your children with truth. So, folks, the future has a great, great, it's, well, it's a great opportunity for us. But we've got to act on it now. So we need to share our faith, the workplace, the neighborhood, everywhere we go. Let people know we believe in Jesus Christ. He is our hope, our strength. He is our future. And as we share that faith and other people come to know him as their Lord and Savior, it's transformative. And that, in part, is how we secure America's future. All right, folks, out of time. Thanks so much for joining us today. Let me leave you with this. The encouraging words of the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians 6, where he says, when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you have taken your stand, by all means, keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is powered by the Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234. 